You're trying to hurt the vehicle that may be the only vehicle for a certain rescue somewhere. That's the part I don't understand. Maybe they don't think they're lying, but they're too ignorant and they start ripping on another foundation like ours. If they have success in what they're doing, they're gonna hurt a vehicle that might be the only vehicle available in a certain place at a certain time to rescue children. Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Tim Ballard Podcast. Very special episode for many reasons. And one of those reasons is this big hunk of a man <laughs> sitting next to me. His name is Matthew uh, Norman <laughs> Cooper. That is his middle oh, name, great. unfortunately. And Matt Cooper was the very first person who I hired when we started Operation Underground Railroad. Uh, he was with me on all of the, the major operations that, that we did, the ones you've seen in documentaries, including the one depicted in the film Sound of Freedom. So I thought I'd bring Matt Cooper on to talk a little bit about it because this is an episode I'm kind of excited about. People say all the time, like, you know, the, the, the conventional wisdom is don't respond to the haters. You're just elevating them. And sometimes I do it, but sometimes I just don't. And today I woke up and I decided I wasn't going to not respond to the haters. So this episode is called Hate Mail. And it has a little jingle that goes along with this episode, like hate mail. I'm going to let Matt Cooper do it. So like, what's the, let's, what, what's like the jingle? You know what I mean? Like the, like the <laughs> oh, theme song God. to this episode. <laughs> Just sing it real quick. Hate mail, ba 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 ba. Hate mail, ba 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 ba. Hate mail, 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 mail. <laughs> hate mail. Yes! <laughs> wow! I thought you'd add some other lyrics, but like some, does something rhyme with mail? Is there anything that rhymes with mail? Uh... Jeez, I don't know. Find out where the rhymes with mail, mail, and then throw it into the song. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll think about it. We'll do that. I'll, during commercial break, I'll, okay. I'll write it up. Okay, so we got some hate mail in the form of different articles that have come in. Um, we're going to go over th about three of them today. And I just want, you, I, I, I want your feedback because you were there for these things, you know? And the people who wrote them, surprise, surprise, they weren't there. But somehow they're the experts of what happened. No, I know. Isn't that funny? But this one, this one kind of makes me sad because I actually like this person, Kristen Abrams. Um, she works for the, um, she works for the, uh, uh, the McCain Institute, which I'm a fan of. This is no, I'm not hating back, but I'm gonna defend. Um, and it's just sad, Kristen. And I'll invite you on the show to come defend this later. It's sad. It's sad that you're doing this. I don't know your intent um, because it, it's not gonna pan out. Sorry, in the end. The story's not going to pan out for you, what you wrote. Sound of Freedom misleads audiences about the horrible reality of human trafficking. So I'm just going to let you respond first. Basically, it's, it's a pretty short story. Um, she says, what all moviegoers, especially our nation's top lawmakers, must know. She takes issue with the fact that we just had a screening that was uh, presided and hosted by Kevin McCarthy. And my gosh, what happened at the end of that? is they literally, there's three bills they're, 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 they're putting in. Even, um, you know, even our friend uh, Kristen would agree, I'm sure. One of them is to go find the 85,000 children who were missing. So, stay, uh, so Kristen, you said this, this film does more harm than good. Is that more harm than good? Having a bill that's going to go find 85,000 children, unaccompanied minors who showed up at our border and now are lost in the belly of a nation that's the top consumer of child exploitation material in the world. So is that good or bad? Because... You said, you said it does more harm than good. That's probably one good thing. The other bills we'll talk about later. But she continues, and she says, um, now before that, I'll, I'll say this. I agree with most of what you're writing. I agree with the part that says, contrary to what is shown in the film, most child trafficking victims know and trust the traffickers. They are not kidnapped by shadowy strangers. That's, that's true. That's true. Um, but where, does the film say that doesn't happen? Does the film suggest that that's not what happens, um, and, and that's okay. I can make that point. I'll, I'll say it to you that if you're being fair and honest, you would have called me and I would have told you that I executive produced a documentary. It's on Amazon Prime. It's called It's Happening Right Here. Are you familiar with the, the, the documentary It's Happening Right Here that I uh, co-produced with Nick Nanton and DNA Films? Yeah, I'm familiar with it. Uh, well, tell me about it. Actually, I'm embarrassed to say I don't know that I've seen it. <laughs> oh, wow. That's embarrassing. Can we edit that piece out? It talks all about what human trafficking and child exploitation looks like in the United States. It goes deep into it. We're very open about the fact that 
human trafficking and child exploitation has different faces in different places. Um, and I'll give you my conclusion here in a second when I read this. And I want you, I want you to respond to this because here she's describing you and me and the rescue operation that you were part of that's depicted in the film. Okay, here it goes. Ready? The Sound of Freedom glorifies rescue missions, disregarding decades of research and experience, showing that international sting operations are dangerous, sometimes illegal, <laughs> and often unethical, and fail to dismantle or discourage human trafficking. While rescues and raids make an action-packed movie, they are far from the preferred response to any kind of human trafficking. What are your thoughts? Did you do something illegal or unethical? No. Okay, let me say. So this is interesting. And Kristen, I'm going to invite you to, um, we're, we're holding a summit very soon with actual children who were rescued from this operation. So I would love for you to be invited if you'd like to come. And I'd love for you to read this article to them because I'd love to hear their uh, response. The truth is there's so many ways to fight human trafficking. And I do agree with Kristen. I do agree that what she says is true which is why we combat that form of, of slavery and exploitation as well. And we, we, uh, we, we do that. And the truth is, do you think Kristen or do you think Kristen's ever done a raid and rescue operation? Oh, no. Do you think she has any idea it. how effective that might be? Or do you think she's ever looked into the eyes of a child who was rescued from a raid and rescue operation? No, I very much doubt it. And, and I, Take issue. I mean, it was it was it was effective for those kids, real kids. Yeah. You know what about them? And you and I were there months later, and a street vendor in the black market actually said, "We we solicited, you know, like, hey, we're looking, you know, we're looking for kids or whatever, whatever, however our approach was." But he essentially said, "Oh no no no, it's no good, it's no good. You didn't hear. There's been a big, there's been a big arrest." I mean, essentially said you can't, you can't solicit that. Can't. We laid a deterrent effect, which was part of what we, why we did it that way. In fact, we, the, the Colombian police gave a, you know, gave a deterrent uh, story on purpose, made it loud. And what happened was people decided the barrier to entry into the black market of child trafficking might be too high now. We might consider not selling kids anymore. So a lot of good was done by this. But according to Kristen Abrams, it's all a net negative. Uh, maybe she would agree that there is one positive is that it gave her a venue to write an op-ed in which she was able, ironically, to speak. Again, I will give her, the. I will tell her, it is true. Most child trafficking victims know their trafficker. What's, what's interesting is <laughs> in this movie, a lot of those kids in real life knew their traffickers also. One, I can think of a couple of cases. It was, a, it was the, the, the teacher, the, the model, Kelly Juarez. She did know them. She got to know them. It was a lure situation. So the film actually depicts exactly what she says it doesn't depict. Um, the bottom line is, Kristen and anyone listening, um, how dare you or anybody dictate to a child, because it's easier to, you, you're not going to hurt me, to a child, you're going to tell that child what kind of rescue they need. And if it doesn't fit into, the, into the, 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 the worldview that you have, then I guess they're better off not being rescued. Because you're saying we shouldn't have done this. That's what you're saying. And many others have said it. I don't mean to pounce on Kristen because there's many people who, who take this position. Um, and I've asked those people, will you tell that to the kid that was rescued? Because they're, they're, they're young adults now. And they'll come, will you stand courageously before them and tell them you never should have been rescued? But I invite you, Kristen, to apologize. I don't care. Not to me. You won't do that anyway. Apologize to those kids. They deserve an apology from you because they went through hell and they want to tell their story because believe it or not, even if it's a small percentage of kids who are trafficked the way that you see in Sound of Freedom, that's still a lot of kids because there's only millions of children stuck in this. So that means a lot, maybe hundreds of thousands uh, are taken in this way and used in this way. But I guess their stories can never be told because you've never touched something like that and therefore it must not exist. It shouldn't exist uh, because you don't have the solution for those kids because not, no amount of conferences, no amount of... Of, of lectures on how poverty creates the problem, no amount of preventative education. You're not, there's nothing that would have helped those kids except direct intervention, infiltrating a trafficking organization. That's what rescued them. It was the only way to get them out of hell. And so you do them a disservice by pretending that that's not real. And I would love an apology for those children. I'll just add one other thing. 
I mean, that operation was like a case study for the Columbians. They never done anything like that before. When we left, we continued to work with them on, on other similar ops. Other Absolutely. NGOs have done the same thing that you've supported. That's right. So that it's, it's continued. It has been a deterrent. Kids are grateful that their lives have been saved because of it. It's very sad. It's very sad. Someone in this space. Again, I will say that all the solutions you're putting forth, I agree with, Kristen. I agree with what you're doing. I am a fan of the McCain Institute. I'm a fan of all the things you are doing. The fact that you're going to decide that you're going to isolate uh, the, the part of the world of human trafficking that you understand and, and, and then really just like pretend the other part doesn't exist and, and thus abandon those kids and abandon for those children the only tool that will rescue them, the only vehicle. I, I hope you see that this is not a good, this is not a good, uh, not a good picture you're painting here. Um, because again, I'm, and I'm sorry that I'm getting emotional, but I, it's, I, there's, there's a difference between you and I, Kristen. I've seen those children. I've held their hands. I've looked into their eyes. I've talked to them. I'm, we, we, I've, still, I've, I've been friends with them for years. Now they're young adults. One of those kids ended up uh, um, saving another young woman who was being trafficked in a more traditional way, uh, got her out, got her to aftercare, and adopted the baby that she was planning to abort. Okay, this kid is going to be there. He's, he, he's, he, he's depicted by a, a, a child in the film called Simba. And he's going to be at the summit along with, with, with um, several others who are going to tell their, their stories. So, um, again, would love to invite you to read your story to them and get their response. This one's interesting. This one came out in the Salt Lake Tribune. Robert Gerke, Tim Ballard's story in The Sound of Freedom seems too good to be true. Because it isn't true. Now, first of all, the, the whole thing's interesting because um, he talks about literally like one scene in the entire film. One scene only. It doesn't even, you know, it's basically a two-hour movie. The scene at the border with the little boy, mm -hmm. that's what he's talking about here. That makes up, what, 10 minutes of a two-hour film? But that's the whole film, according to Robert Gerkes. That's everything. The whole film's right here, and, and we're going to prove that Tim Ballard's a liar. Uh, in this film. Now, Robert's actually a nice guy. I think he's a nice guy. I, I actually, after I read the story, I, I called him and he was surprised, I think. I, wow. I met with him. So um, I went through this so um, with him. And it was actually a kind, it was a good conversation, honestly. Um, in, 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 in full transparency, he did reach out to our media team. I, apparently, I don't know how much time was given to respond, but we didn't respond in, in time for the story to come out. I, I I don't know the details of that, but I do. I, and I told them on the call. I said, I understand you, you didn't have, act, you, we didn't, it would have been great to have talked before. So I, I don't, I don't think he's a bad guy. And I don't think Kristen's a bad person, but your words have to be contested. And I hope you understand that. Um, so here, here's, here's the, the basis. And you, if you read the story, you'll see what he's, what he's saying here. He's talking about, um, uh, being at the border, I so the story, the true story is I get a call on July 3rd and I'm with my family. We're about ready to go to the July 4th celebration and, and I get cut out of the port of entry. The CBP officer, his name is Apolli Nair, calls me. He, he got an award for this, by the way. So he, he saw this van come across the border. He sees something. He said something just didn't feel right. That's it. Something didn't feel right. This, 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 this white American guy driving a van with a Hispanic five-year-old boy in the back pulls him over, calls me, and he says, there's stuff in the van that I see that makes me nervous. There's drugs, videotapes. I need you to come down. I think this guy traffics children across the border. I then respond. The first thing I do is I go through the van. According to Robert's, the, the author's uh, words here in the story, I, had two, I, I responded, and then two hours later, according to court documents, I then interview the bad guy, Buchanan, and talk to the kid. Now, to rely on court documents, first of all, is like, like a fatal flaw. Because court documents like affidavits, you know, things like that, that it's very minimal amount. Very mi You just write enough to get the guy probable cause to arrest. You don't tell the whole story, right? Right. So he, he I, I feel it's deceptive to readers to act as though, because the average reader doesn't know that. They might figure, based on the way Robert's talking, if it's not in a court document, it must not have happened. And he knows better. I know he knows like that, that can't be true. So he should have said that. Like, this just a court document. Other things might have happened. But that would ruin his story. So he, he's not going to say that. So then I, we write a search warrant uh, that night. 
I look at the video. Okay, first of all, I look at the video. It breaks my heart. A five-year-old boy just being sexually abused like you can't believe. And I'm not even going to tell you what it is. I remember it's at least 30 minutes long. Heartbreaking. I'm, cr I'm already crying watching this. Okay. So um, I then go and interview the bad guy. And then I go talk to the kid. And that, that, those things made it into the report. Uh, there was one report that said the kid's face wasn't visible. It was visible. But the court says, I don't care what the court says. I don't even know. What that, I don't care. I, w I was different than the court. There's one difference between me and the court documents, whatever, who wrote them. I don't even know who wrote them. Is the difference is I was there. I was the one watching the video. I'm probably the only one who had to watch the full video enough times to describe it in detail. And the kid's face was visible. Not fully visible, but a lot of his face was visible. Enough for me to walk into the room and see the little kid. And I thought, oh my gosh, there he is. I, and it was a big deal to me that I had seen uh, for the first time a kid that I'd seen in a video in real life. That was a big deal to me. And I'll come back to that in a second. Um, he says, I couldn't, have seen the, I couldn't have seen the video before I saw the kid because I only had two hours. But as I told him on the, on the Zoom call a few days ago, I said, Robert, the video is 30 minutes. You, ha you, you had me at the port of entry for two hours. I could have watched it like four times. I think I watched it at least two because I'm going to write reports on it, right? I got to see all the details. Um, then we write, a search, we, we write a search warrant for the guy's house up in San Bernardino. The next day, 4th of July, the symbol wasn't lost on us, what we were doing. Mm. And, and Homeland Security along with uh, the um, agents, the, 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 the uh, sheriff's office of San Bernardino raided the house. We got to the house and we saw evidence that children were all over. There's toys there, um, kids sleeping bags, places for kids to sleep, cameras everywhere. The, the, the bed, the very bed and the headboard that I recognized from the video, this is where the kid was being raped. And then, and then I remember amongst other things, drugs or oh, drugs everywhere, Xanax, lorazepam, things that would take, make a kid fall asleep. Or, you know, uh, so you can abuse them, and uh, and that piece is actually shown in the in the film as well, Sound of Freedom, uh, and uh, and these little cards. I remember these little cards. They were like passes for like like a, a local amusement park, like one of those like kind of small ones, you know, that looks like a like a carnival kind of situation that's like that's permanent, you know. And based on that, over the next two days, led by the sheriff's office, the San Bernardino Sheriff's Office. We found 11 children on top of that, okay? So that's, that's basically the story, all right? And that, that, that could be a two-hour movie just on oh, its yeah. own. And it was going to be, by the way. Like, when, when, when they wrote the original script, they wanted to go there. I, told, I said, don't go there. I, I need you to connect that story to the one in Columbia or some other story because these kids, especially when they were writing it, they were, they were still minors. They're not anymore but I just didn't want to talk too much about details about a case that, um, that might allow people to identify who these kids are. And that's, that's why I, I told them don't, don't go into the story, but, but because of you know, Robert and others, we have to address it now, which is fine. And I, and I gave Robert a big thank you for not, for redacting the names. Others, less you know, ethical journalists haven't. But they at least, you know, cut, like redacted their names out, and that was that was good of him. So anyway, so he takes issues with with two statements I make. Okay, one, I, I now I speak like a thousand times a year, right? So I I guess like four years ago I was telling the story and it got documented, and I said I said that we got intel that this guy was taking kids across the border. We went down, I saw the kid, and it was the first time I saw a kid who I'd seen in a video. I'm like, yep, and he read that to me. Like, yeah, that's what happened. Well, you made it sound like the intel came before the stop. I said, well, if, if that's what it sounds like, that's not what I meant. When the CBP officer called me, that was intel. He told me this guy we believe is taking kids across the border. There's all sorts of intel. Let me tell you something. The, the CBP has a system, and they can see how many times he crosses, which is a lot of times. So that's intel. I didn't say that I got it like two weeks ago or a month ago. And then he also thought that I must have been implying that I had seen this kid's face in a video from months ago or something. I'm like, well, I didn't say that. I just say that it was the first I saw the kid and I realized I recognized him from a video that I'd seen before. And I said, is that is that really going to be your story? You know, um, and then he said he took issue with the fact that I said we raided the house in San Bernardino and liberated 11 kids. 
Okay, the kids weren't in the house, Tim. I didn't say they were in the house. Well, you're impl- you're implying that they're like locked up in a basement. One of them said that his editor said that. I'm like, how did you? I didn't imply anyone was locked up or even in the house. I said we raided the house and liberated kids. And 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 he and he says, well, well, first of all, there was a report where you called or it was me that called the the house where the little boy lived up in San Bernardino, and the sister answered the phone. I said, yeah, that's right. Well, how could you have liberated her? And I said, okay, let me walk this through. I'll walk you through this. Imagine me talking to her and the, and the 10 others and saying, you know that guy that rapes you every weekend? He takes, you, he takes them to his house, lures them with this and that, threatens the families because they're illegal, and says, if you don't let your kids come, I will call immigration. And if you let them come, I'll, pay, I'll let you live here for free. So if I go to one of those kids and say, guess what? You'll no longer have to go and be raped. Do you think they felt liberated? If I asked them, were you liberated? And he didn't, he kind of acknowledged, or at least like didn't contest. They were liberated. And I found them with the team led by San Bernardino Sheriff's Office on the 4th and the 5th of July and maybe some days after found all 11 kids. So when I said we raided the house and liberated them, I said, to be, to be honest, if I told the full story, I look way more badass. Because that means that we didn't just go to the house. We had to go on a child hunt. Right. So I look actually better if I told the full story. I, I, I underreport by assuming that they're just waiting for me to get out of the house. Right? Exactly. So I'm like, what, it, what is this story all about? And plus, it's a movie. I mean, how do you, I mean, it's a long story. How do you condense that down so it can fit in a well, he, he doesn't. Story, he doesn't contend that the, movie, the movie's allowed to take liberties. I'm not. So that's why he, he's, tra- he's using quotes that I made. Oh, that you made. And I'm like, well, I guess I could have said it clearer, but it's just kind of a weird thing. Like, you're admitting and showing court documents showing that I did lead an operation that rescued these, this brother and sister from a life of rape right. and 11 other kids. You're saying that happened, but I'm still the bad guy in the story. Let's just, I'll say that again. He's not contesting that I led an operation that rescued these two kids and 11 others. The court documents he cites prove it. But I'm the bad guy in the story. That's it. That, there, there's your headline. Okay. Um, he also said that um, the dog tag story, the, the necklace. In, this fi- in the film Sign of Freedom, there is a necklace. Can someone bring the necklace over to me? In the film Sign of Freedom, the little boy gives my character, Cavisol, a necklace that his sister had given him. Well, that's a true story. In the film, the necklace is, thank you. In the, in, in the film, the necklace has my name on it, right? And that was like this connection point between me and the kid. I actually told this, the, the, the writers of Sound of Freedom, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, include this scene because uh, um, no one's going to believe it. Hard to believe. Yeah, here it is. Here's the actual necklace. It's got a scripture on it, First Timothy 6.11. That's my name, Timothy, Okay. And I didn't even recognize my name on this until later when one of my children, Jimmy, he, he was about the kid's age, but he's like young at the time. And he said, why is your name on this necklace? And it, it meant something to me. You know, you can mock me and say whatever, you crazy person of faith that believes that God can talk to you through things like necklaces. Well, I believe that. And I'll stand by that. I don't really care what you think. And so it did mean something to me. And he said, his contention was, I must be making this up because it's not in the court documents. This would never be in a court document. There's no reason. There's a scene where the kid, the true scene, he runs to me. He's crying. He's hugging. We're both sobbing in each other's arms. The, 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 the aftercare workers are crying like, what's going on? And he says, I don't belong here. And I'm sobbing. And then he gives me this necklace. This is my sister gave this to me. Will you help me? We got to get her and others out of this guy. It's like way like he's, well, she wasn't kidnapped. And the kid wasn't kidnapped. And I said, well, how do you know? Because the court documents, okay, well, let me explain something about plea deals. He was charged with kidnapping, okay? Later on, he pled out, and some of the charges get dropped. This is criminal justice 101. And so in the end, he didn't get convicted of kidnapping, but that doesn't mean he didn't kidnap. Um, and the doc tag story and the hug scene are real. Also, there's some court document that indicates that the kid was interviewed once. What that means is he was forensically interviewed once. A child will only be forensically interviewed once if they're doing their job right. 
That means that's when they get the kid to say all the gross details, all the horrific things that happened to them. And experts do that. I'm not a forensic interviewer. I didn't attempt to do that. However, I interviewed him at least three times. Not about that, but about where he came from, why he was with this guy, who this man is to him, who, who's, you know, where's his sister, what other kids are hanging out with this guy. And that's a very long process, by the way. You don't just ask those questions. I took, and, and he mocks me, and he says, um, then Ballard takes the kid out for burgers. No, really, like being sarcastic, like, of course he didn't. Yeah, well, I did, okay? I took a little kid out for burgers to try to get to the bottom of it and save other kids. Eight mailers love to hate. I, it's just, it's, a, it's, it's so bizarre, right? Because in my head the whole time, I'm just thinking, again, I have to, I'm the bad guy in the story, but without my actions, 12 kids would be would have been raped. But I'm the, ba I'm the bad guy, man. I'm the bad guy in the story. I'm the yeah. bad guy. That's, Save kids. We just don't like, the way, you, don't like yeah. the way you told the story about it. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> um, and then he says, and I'm not the first one. I'm not the first one, he says, to point out, uh, to point out the bad, uh, that, that Tim's a liar. And then he goes to Vice. And he talks about this girl that we call Liliana. Liliana was a girl that I talked about at the White House a few years ago. I testified before Congress, and I wrote two op-eds about, I mentioned her in them, they weren't about her. Uh, and the story is a girl who was taken at 11 years old. She was trafficked across the border with a part of the southern border where there was no wall or barrier, and that caused her a life of horrific rape. Um, in the Fox Ed, in the Fox News op-ed I wrote about this, because I was arguing for border enforcement, I said, we eventually helped her out of her hell. It's very reduced. Fox making me very reduced. I, I could have been more clear on what that meant, but you know what we did for this girl. She, I have emails from her saying, you saved my life. You helped me out of my hell. In post-rescue aftercare, she was, she was very lonely. She was suicidal. She lived in a closet room. She, her life was miserable, and she wanted to be an advocate. She wanted to work for me and OUR, and I offered her a job. And by her own admission, we helped her out of her, her hell. Um, well, Vice said that I'm implying that I rescued her, when in fact the court records indicate she rescued herself. Well, Vice had to eliminate, intentionally, of course, the evidence that I didn't say that. Because contemporaneous to the Fox News piece, I also wrote a piece for Deseret News. Deseret News is a local Utah outlet, and they gave me all the space I wanted. I wasn't limited. And in that, I was very clear, she rescued herself. Also, I testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee about border enforcement. I told her story, and again, with her in the room, I told the story again, saying, and, and I, I, she, by the way, cleared this. I have it in writing where she cleared this and asked me to tell her story, okay? And I said she rescued herself. Robert actually, he actually says, Tim told the story in, in, in before Congress and in op-eds. Well, Robert, you didn't, read, you didn't read what I wrote or you never would have mimicked or parroted a tabloid because I clearly state that she rescued herself. If I was trying to hide that fact and, and, and bury it in some Fox News op-ed, I wouldn't have exposed the truth in two other sources, one testifying before Congress, uh, if I was trying to pretend that I had done that. So there you go. So that's, that's, a, dead, that's a dead issue. Um, he also said that I lied about time warp. I time warped this, meaning this operation actually happened in 2006. But I didn't start. I didn't leave the government until 2013. But Tim's making you. The movie makes it connects it like it. It's it's happening like right away. Mm -hmm. Well, Tim does the same thing because because why his proof? Because I like to use that story, and I do connect it to when I left OUR. But that's seven years later. How could you connect it? I'll tell you how I connect it. And I told him this. I said this was a big deal to me. It was again. It was the first time I saw a child in real life who was a who was a victim of. Um, of trafficking. It was also the fact that he gave me this necklace. That was a big deal to me with my name on it. That was angelic to me. That was providential to me. Uh, so, and that's when I made the decision, as I've explained in the docuseries uh, at PragerU called Light in the Darkness and other places, that's when I committed to fighting human trafficking and child slavery for the rest of my life. So seven years later, when I leave to start OUR, you better believe I was wearing this necklace. And, and you know you saw me wearing this necklace on other operations, right? True. It, it was a big deal to me. It's not a time warp lie. It's a real thing. It's a real connection. Oh, he talks about Oshensky in the movie. Um, can someone get that book for me? Um, Oshensky, you remember, he's the first guy that gets arrested. Uh, I've told this in episode one. It's based on a very true story. This is a pedophile who 
Thank you. I pretend I he he doesn't want to talk, so I pretend that I'm a pedophile. I pretend I'm Tim Ballard, special agent and closet pedophile. I have to do that to gain his trust. I knew he'd written a lot of literature like this big book and other articles about how all men really are sexually attracted to prepubescent children. And that's the natural way of things. Um, and so I played on that and made it, I said, look, I said, there's only one person who has a bigger child exploitation material collection than you do, and that's me. I got an evidence vault full of it. So how can I, how can I deal with so much beauty? This is a line from the film, it really, really happened. He got arrested, I believe, on state charges first. He got out on bail, and then I continued to pretend I was Tim Ballard, pedophile. That's the true wow. story. So I, he did get out of detention, not because I, re I requested he was on bail for state charges, but now he was looking at federal charges, and that's when I continued to have the conversation with him. The prosecutor's like, arrest this guy, arrest this guy. We had found all this material, like five enormous, um, uh, enormous files, um, external hard drives, and I said, stop, let, let me give me more time. I took him for a walk behind his house. There's a river and a park, and, we, we, and I finally got him to confess and then got him to give me other intel on other cases. We ended up getting, after I got everything I needed, I had to pretend to be a pedophile. Now, again, it's one thing if I'm Brian Smith or some other name, and I can really pretend to be someone different, but this was me. I was myself and also a pedophile. It was very different mentally. It was a lot more difficult and kind of torturous, really. And so I couldn't wait to end this and tell him that I'm not a pedophile, right? So we ended up in a coffee shop in a little town in, in, in Minnesota called North Bridge, Minnesota, I believe. And the same little river that goes by his house went by the, the, the coffee shop, I remember. And we sat down, just like you see in the film, and he gives me this book, a book that he knew that I had already read. He puts an inscription. Look, at there, here he is. This is the actual dude. <laughs> nice. He looks like the actor, doesn't he? He kind of does. What do you think? Wow. You see that? And in the film, it's like a longer... It's a, it's a longer um, inscription. To Agent Ballard, live well, Connemore. That's his gnome de plume. So, and I'll show this to Robert. I'm like, bro, this, this all happened. Like, and you know better, just because it's not going to show up in a court document. The truth is, these guys all pled guilty. Bachman and Oshensky both pled guilty, which means that all the material, the vast majority, probably 98% of what is in the reports of investigation, never get out because it requires a trial to actually turn over discovery, and now it's in the trial, now it's in the record, now you can see it. But when you plead guilty, you don't get to see all these stories. But I know them because, again, the difference between me and Robert and me and Kristen and me and everyone else is I was actually there. And there's other people who were also there who will also say the same thing. Robert said that he's gonna write another story. He didn't want to retract this one. I think that's probably too much to ask, but he says he's willing to write another story where I get to answer these questions. Um, I don't know. I don't know if he'll do it or not. Um, I hope he does. But even if he does, which I will be grateful, and I'll come back on the show and give you an update if he does. But in the meantime, I think that you should know this is how these things work. Don't believe what you read. You see, you see how it happens? It was so easy for him to just extrapolate what he wanted, pretend that everything's in a court document or didn't happen, and you can see how the truth becomes false and the false becomes truth. It's, it, and that's what happens. I wouldn't believe anything I ever read just based on how I've been treated over and over again by the media. But again, at the end of the day, what Robert's trying to pitch you is, is simply this. I'll, I'll say it again. Not contending that 11 kids were rescued. Not contending that a little boy was rescued at the border. Not contending that I led that rescue operation. Nope, I did all those things. I was blessed to be part of that and do those things. But I'm still the bad guy in the story. And that's the headline that he wants to, 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 to sell you. And... It just, in the end, it didn't add up. Did I tell him? I did. I said, look, I could have been clear that the intel I got was that night. It wasn't weeks earlier like the film. Um, the kid that I saw in the video, uh, you know, I had just barely seen him an hour or so before I saw him in real life. I didn't say that in the one sentence I gave that you're quoting. And I, I, I guess it would have been good if I was clear, clear on that or I wasn't as clear on the, the line that I, when I said that we raided the place and liberated kids, I, I wasn't clear that we had, we had to actually do extra cool things, badass investigative things that mostly others did, okay? Like San Bernardino Sheriff's Office, I think, really led that. Um, I didn't say that in the one and a half sentences that you're trying to use against me. But I wish I had because, like I said, it's actually a better story. And if I was the braggadocious, uh, proud person you wish I was, 
because it's good for your for your story. Uh, I would have. I would have told you the other part. I underreported, um, and yet, and yet here we are having to defend ourselves. The, this other story. This this has been around since 2020, and I'm gonna. T- it's, 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 this 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 one is is interesting. I almost I feel bad for this person. Her name is Meg Connolly. I feel bad that she did oh, this. Um, it's it's very sad. It's called called by God. It's she's trying to mock me, right? So when we first started our operations, you remember Meg Connolly, right? Oh, yeah. This was like the second operation we ever did. It was in 2014. And we, someone close to us, I was friends with her parents. They lived down the street from me. And she was a, a blogger and she was having some success. No one knew who we were. So I, I asked her if she'd like to come and, you know, watch this happen. If there was something shady, of course, why would I want to bring a, someone who could report on it? Um, we were too early to like call a big na- a big news outlet because no one even knew who we were. Um, she agrees to come, and she and she writes a story called "Called of God," and she says Tim Ballard told me he'd been called of God. So first of all, it's, it's so not fair to say that. Like, it's painting me as like some wild some wild eyed prophet. Like, I'm called of God, and like as if I said that to her, right? It's <laughs> I know. It's like yeah, I was something like I was deciding what to do for college, so I prayed about it, and I felt like I should do this. Like right. people do that every day. Yeah, but, yeah. But, but but it's bad for the story. Yeah, it's better for the story. He told me he was called of God. Okay. Now I think everyone has callings, and I think I do think that I have followed, and my wife and I, as you and others, have followed inspiration. People of faith do that, and I do believe that this is the will of the Lord for me to do this and leave my job and do this. But to, right there, you know, she, she's going to try to make me look crazy. So. Um, she also likes to point out in this story that I was represented at the time by WME, a talent agency. That's right. You're dang right. I, I was. And, and, I, and I am represented by someone else today because they know how to get me and people that work with me on stages. That's the awareness piece. I'm happy to hire people who are experts at making our voice louder because our voice is representing these children who are being hurt. So, you know, but she's making me out. I'm just like some, just want to be a superstar, of course. You know, just because someone gets well-known doesn't mean that's their intent. But that's, that's the problem. Be- because I'm well-known, especially with this film, it must follow that that's the only reason he did it. That is the reason he did it. But here's the funny thing. We hire a marketing department. Every nonprofit in the world would love their founder to be well-known. Let's just be honest, because that drives your mission. So it's, it's, it doesn't make sense, does it? It doesn't work out. Um... She keeps talking about this housekeeper. I love this part. The bewildered housekeeper. She was victimized just like me. The housekeeper was an HSI agent who was undercover from the embassy, right? right. <laughs> and she's multiple times she talks about the poor housekeeper. She was so scared. No, she was an undercover operator. You think, <laughs> like, it's so, so silly. You know, I deceived her, of course. By the way, after she finished the operation, she wrote, I believe, two, at least one, glowing reviews for, Wash- for Huffington Post about the operation. It was all great until eight years later. It was all of a sudden, it wasn't great anymore. So she spends a lot of time telling the story and that's mostly accurate. And then she gets into, um, you know, she gets into the piece where she starts learning the truth about us. Um, And she actually, she, now Coop, she actually called an expert in human trafficking. Wow. She called the next human traffic and told her the story of how these kids showed up, traffickers were arrested, and they were taken out of the house. She left, so she couldn't, I don't know where they went. Maybe they went nowhere. Oh, my gosh. But she called an expert who lives probably 1,000 to 3,000 miles away and was a probably between 1,000 and 3,000 miles away when it happened. And the expert said, sounds like they exploited those kids. What do you think about that? <laughs> sounds like the kids were actually re-victimized. S- sounds like someone that attends a lot of conferences. She says that sh- a couple of the kids, I swear, they, I don't think they've ever been trafficked before. Really? Wow, you must have s- superpower gifts to be able to look at s- a situation you've never been in and determine whether they had been trafficked before or not. And In fact, they were just you know, lured into this situation. She goes on. Um, again, the terrified, I love this, the terrified housekeeper, like the HSI agent who was pretending to be terrified. Um, but she began to see the truth and face the truth. We, la- we made their lives worse. Okay, I'm going to read this one here. Tim Ballard created just another childhood trauma for these kids. We made their lives worse. So we made their lives worse. Okay, let me, here, here's the problem. Here's the conclusion. This operation, seven traffickers showed up. Seven traffickers were arrested. You were there. I was there. Seven traffickers were convicted. And seven traffickers are sitting in jail right now. Okay. 
Also, of the 26 that showed up, nine of them were minors. The other ones were adults, and they had the choice to come get services or not. Some of them, you can't control when a trafficker is bringing people to you. You can't control who they bring to you. Um, but when children show up, and nine children were there, nine children were there, all nine children received superb and professional aftercare services from International Justice Mission. Now, all this is online. And all this was online when Meg wrote her story. It wouldn't have been hard to find this. So no matter what happened in that operation, okay, whatever you want to say that this wasn't, she didn't want to be here or she did want to be here or all, all they got was a, was a soda pop and a swim and we traumatized them worse. None of these people, Meg included, would ever want to confront those nine children who got rescued and had three years of aftercare services. I would love to watch Meg tell them, you weren't really rescued. Nothing, you, your life yeah. is worse, not better for not being raped anymore. I would love to see it. It'd be, they'll never show up. They won't even answer the question. So Meg, I'd love to have you come on the show and I'd love to answer, I would love, to, I could bring some of them. We're in contact with them. Would you be willing to talk to them and tell them that they weren't really rescued and, th and that we made their lives worse? But here's the bottom line. If you tell the story that I just told, that you told it here, and a lot of it was accurate, like in terms of the facts, but then you get into Meg's expert analysis. Yeah. She admits this is the first and only time she's ever done anything like this, but she's also the expert. In, in, in right. because, well, she did yeah. consult with people 3,000 miles away who told her that this looks like something bad. Okay, but if you tell the story of, what, of, 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 of any way, even if good, bad, or ugly, if you want to say it's horrible or wonderful, like she did, it was first wonderful, seven years later it's horrible, but any way you slice it, however you want to tell the story, if you leave out two facts, you're, you have no credibility. And those two facts that are readily available for you to research and find, seven people arrested and convicted, nine children liberated and given three years of aftercare services. If, do you think those are important components to that story of children being rescued? I, I do. I don't know. I'm curious to know what Meg thinks. I mean, I think you've been talking about that. It's... I, I don't think there is a story if you don't include the fact that seven people were arrested and convicted and nine children were given aftercare. <laughs> the fact that Meg Connolly left those absolutely fundamental paramount points out of her story leaves us with only two options. Either she's a liar or she's one of the worst researchers I I've ever seen. Either way, the story has no credibility. You can't believe somebody who would leave those two facts out. Now those two facts, of course, destroy her story. So she has to leave them out. <laughs> um, I love this too. After she's being called out after this, I remember she, she did a post and she said, well, how could it be wrong? Th these editors at Slate, like th they're award-winning editors. I've published seven books. I can't blame my editors for anything. They weren't there. They weren't in there when I was doing the research. They weren't, like you can't blame your editors and say that, th that they could be the best in the world. They weren't there. They're going off your analysis and what you thought you saw. And the bottom line is when you leave out those facts, you lose all credibility. So she ends it with this kind of flair, right? She ends it with this. She, we're talking about Sound of Freedom. Sound of Freedom at this point had already, like some trailers had been released as so there were some things out there. This is back in 2020. She says, the light filled Ballard home flashes across the screen as a contrast to the dark Columbian spaces. Caviso sheds righteous tears and terrified boys and girls faces often speckled in dirt are front and center. And then she, she quotes a very famous line from the film. Senor Timoteo, one crying little boy asks Ballard in Spanish, you rescue kids, right? That's how she ends it. So what she's doing, a little literary flair, because the answer's obviously no. <laughs> the answer's obviously no, I don't rescue kids. She just proved it by telling a story and leaving out the nine kids who were rescued, but she just proved it. And so it's a little kind of twist, a little punch, and wow, a little literary fl flair. And she ends it, that she doesn't answer the question because, huh, the question's already answered for you. Tim Bell is a fraud, right? Now, let me tell you, because we just talked about the kids at the border. Meg, how dare you? You can hit me all you want. You're not hurting me. I know you think I, you, it's those kids you're hurting. The kid you just quoted is a real five-year-old boy. I want you to think about that. Think about, he's a real five-year-old boy who said something very similar to that to me on the night of July 3rd, 2006. He said that to me. He was in tears. I was hugging him. He was hugging me. He gave me this necklace that has my name on it. 
And we did go find his sister and 11 others. Those are real kids. And you mock them. You mock them in order to throw a dart at me. And maybe get your name famous on the backs of, of the success of, of our foundation. You rescue kids, right? Yeah, the answer is yes. And that kid who said this is one of them. You owe him an apology. You don't have to say sorry to me. I don't care. You think you're hitting me. You're hurting kids when you do this. That's the part that blows my mind. You're discrediting. You're trying to hurt the vehicle that may be the only vehicle for a certain rescue somewhere. That's the part I don't understand. Especially people in the space of human trafficking. When they come out and they rip on anybody or any foundation knowing. Well, the truth is they're not usually experts. Meg Connolly certainly isn't, certainly isn't an expert. But I've seen a lot. I want to name some right now, but I won't. Actually, locally here in Utah that are part of big corporations that pretend to be experts in, in the field. And, they, and then they lie about, or maybe they don't think they're lying, but they're too ignorant, and they start ripping on another foundation like ours. If they have success in what they're doing, they're going to hurt a vehicle that might be the only vehicle available in a certain place at a certain time to rescue children. It's super irresponsible for anybody to pretend to be an expert in this space and make comments that might hurt children. And that's the common thread between all these so-called journalists, or I can't call Meg a journalist, she's not. A blogger, maybe she doesn't call herself a journalist, I don't know. But it's irresponsible to assert some kind of a, a moral authority or an expertise in an area where children's lives hang in the balance. Yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. Is she the worst researcher? Is she a liar? I, I'm not sure. Could be both. For some reason, I, I don't know why people love to hate. I don't know why. They like Well, there's to... a dopamine hit associated yeah. with it. It feels good. You, if, you're, if you're feeling depressed, there's different ways to get dopamine. You can go exercise. You can uh, lie about somebody. And you can see your name in print on Slate Magazine, you know, or USA Today. I think there's a, there's a dopamine hit associated with it. And yeah, I think you're right. And... I think it's sad. Go, go, go in a different field and play that game. Go to politics or sports or go somewhere else. Stay out of the child rescue realm because you're going to hurt kids. If you, if you have the success you want to have, you're going to hurt kids. And so I'm standing here, if I'm overly emotional, if I'm making someone feel bad, I, I, I don't really care because I'm not speaking for myself right now. I have seen it. I have spent thousands of hours watching little prepubescent children, average age seven, six years old, be violently raped. I've watched it. I've had to document it. I've got a million holes in my brain. So I will stand up and be their voice in front of anyone. One of those kids, Meg Connolly, is the kid you disparaged and mocked. You used words that he actually said in the most traumatic moment of his life. You used those words to try to throw a dart at me. I hope it's worth it for you. You know what we should be talking about? Here's an article we should be talking about. Mel Gibson sent this to me last night. Oh, wow. Yeah. And I said, oh, I'm doing a podcast tomorrow on hate mail. Something that Mel knows a lot about. I think he got some, he's got some hate mail in his life. What was that? The other day we were talking about this and he, he did a video. <laughs> yeah, he did said, a video. Say it. Tell me what he yeah, said. I don't know. I think he's some, uh, <laughs> what, do you, what do you say? Something like, something like uh, the, yeah, people, they're, they're going to come after you, but I don't give a F. He's, he's, he's like, yeah. you know what people are most scared of? public humiliation and he's like i don't give an f anymore they can't hurt me because i don't care anymore yeah and that's what i say to these people you're not hurting me i know it's easy to hurt me because especially the more well-known i get the more fun it is to punch me because well he can take it because he's famous now blah, blah, whatever um but, but that's the thing you're not hurting me you're hurting children i promise you that the spear fund operations underground railroad so many other organizations are the only vehicle that's that the only option for certain kids to be rescued. The only option. And I can say that about probably hundreds of rescue organizations. When you knock that vehicle, you're only hurting kids. Why would you take that risk? United Nations normalizing pedophilia through child sexualization agenda. I would love to meet this person. In fact, I want to get her on the podcast. This person, her name is Sherry Farr. She's the founder and the president of U.S. parents involved in education. She's very concerned about the federal government getting involved in, in local education, which I, I'm worried about the federal and state governments getting involved in local education at this point. Um, this is the stuff we should be talking about, about, about how public schools are sexualizing children, uh, about the, the assaults on children through an agenda, uh, a leftist, godless kind of woke agenda um, that disregards the safety of children in the name of liberating children. And... You know, this report's awesome. I refer, I'll refer, we'll put a link to it in the story. 
in, in the podcast. Um, but she points out an, a report. There's a group called the International Commission of Jurists. It's a division of the United Nations. And in the report, the report says that sexual conduct involving persons below the domestically prescribed minimum of age of consent to sex may be consensual, in fact, if not in law. Okay, what they're doing is they're signing up for the MAP agenda, minor attracted persons. Maybe it's not so bad, after all, that children are having sex with adults. Maybe it shouldn't be against the law. This is coming from the UN at the same time that, the, that the, this agenda is trying to change the name of pedophile to minor attracted person, mm -hmm. at the same time that our kids are giving, being given pornography in the name of sex ed, at the same time when kids as young as 12, 13 years old are allowed to consent to do bodily harm to themselves in, in the form of, of you know, transitioning or puberty blockers, whatever, uh, when any parent knows your 13 year old is not gonna be able to consent to, going, to where they're gonna go on a Friday night. Um, and the pedophiles are laughing. The pedophiles love the UN report, the pedophiles love the sexualization. I've talked about this before, and the pedophiles love kids having consent because if they can consent to body mutilation, they can consent to anything including sex with adults, especially adults who are 50 years old but identify as a 12 year old. This is the world we live in. This is what we should be talking about. Stop trying to knock sound of freedom because it doesn't fit your worldview. Stop trying to knock real rescue operations so you, for whatever reason, by leaving out the material facts that make it a righteous case. And that's what all these people are doing, have been doing, and they will continue to do. And I'm not gonna respond to all of them, but I woke up this morning and thought it'd be fun to respond to hate mail. And I had this vision of Matt Cooper singing the jingle. And so God. we're gonna, we open this show with the jingle. Let's see if he can remember the jingle that he wrote right here. Go. First is me, I hate you. I see hate mail, ba da ba da ba. Hate mail, ba da ba da ba. Slimy as a snail, ba da ba da. Hate mail. Pretty good. I think you're hey. pretty accurate. Uh, yeah. And with that, we'll close out this episode of the Tim Ballard Podcast. See you guys next time. Mm -hmm.